Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Rupal Patel. Rupal is a former CIA officer turned entrepreneur, speaker, and author. After a career in the CIA, she earned her MBA from London Business School and started her first business over 10 years ago. As a CEO, leadership consultant, strategic advisor, coach, and mentor, she now helps founders, leaders, and next generation change makers rewrite the rules of success and become, become unstoppable. She is the author of a new book called From CIA to CEO, Unconventional Life Lessons for Thinking Bigger, Leading Better, and Being Bolder. And I'm excited to have her on the show to learn from her unique experience. So Rupal, welcome. Thank you so much, John. <laughs> it is so good to, to meet you and have you on the show. And I have to say, you are the first uh, former CIA officer we've ever ever had on the show. We've had FBI, uh, we've had uh, all the military branches covered, but uh, never CIA. So this is going to be really interesting. So uh, tell us a little bit about your <laughs> your career path, because you're you're you were born and bred uh, a New Yorker, and now you're living in London. And after serving time as a C. CIA officer. Tell us a little bit about your story. How did you take this strange path into the CIA and now into, you know, now you're in England, you're, you know, you're leading businesses. Tell us a little bit about that. That's pretty, pretty interesting career path. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I always thought I wanted to be a diplomat. I have always loved learning languages, traveling. When I was um, at undergrad or in undergrad, I did a State Department internship between my junior and senior year and lived in Oman and got a taste for life as an expat, as a diplomat and doing some of that work. So I always thought that I would have become a foreign service officer. That was sort of where I thought my life trajectory was going to go. And then I was um, getting a, a master's degree in international affairs. And while I was um, sort of finishing my studies there, I got an, well, an invitation to, to apply for a job at the agency. And I thought, well, uh, what exactly will I be doing? And where will I be living? And you know, I, the CIA was never in my field of vision at all in any right. capacity. But when you get sort of an invitation like that, you it piques your interest. And so I thought, all right, well, what the hell? I don't know what I'll be doing, but here you go. And so it kicked off this, um, well, a very long process of background investigations and, oh, yeah. um, you know, exams and polygraphs and all that kind of fun stuff. And um, anyway, a year later, I got a call from someone at the agency's HR team and said, hey, would you like to start in two weeks? And I said, hell yes. <laughs> um, so, so off I went and still had a a very loose idea of what I was going to be doing. So over the course of the um, the onboarding slash uh, the background investigation process, I got a little bit more detail about what the work would entail. Um, and so I joined the anal analytical cadre at the time, which was in the director directorate of intelligence. And um, that was my role was to, to analyze information, all of the intel reports coming in from the field, from human sources and you know all, all source intel. And most of my career was focusing on one of our war efforts overseas. And so I loved every minute of it. It, it enabled me to, to really develop an expertise in things that I was personally as well as intellectually fascinated with, you know, sort of great power politics and, and war zone and counterinsurgency and all of that stuff that I would never really get any insights into as a civilian. And, um, you know, it felt really meaningful. I, it felt, you know, it was, of course, part of the, the global war on terror and, and our, you know, Operation Enduring Freedom and all of that, you know, big sort of weighty stuff. And it felt really, really good to be a part of something bigger. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you know, probably understand as well, you know, that sense of mission and that sense of, of common purpose is really powerful. And so I loved it. You know, I, I worked with some of the smartest people I will ever work with. I got to mm -hmm. live and very uh, unique places um, and, and middle of nowhere, you know, jungles and deserts and all sorts of things. But it got to a point where I, I you know, I, I started to feel comfortable, not because the work wasn't challenging or because it wasn't stimulating, but it just, I was getting really good. And it, it felt like I could have theoretically done it in my sleep kind of thing. And I don't like getting comfortable. I'm the type of person who, who likes to test myself, see what I'm made of, challenge myself in new ways. And so I thought, okay, well, you know, I could become a career officer and, and, and love every minute of it, or I can 
leave on a high note and see what else is out there and, and you know, and just give it a go and, and experiment. So that's what I did. I moved to London, which is a city I've always wanted to live in. I, it's, you know, it's a wonderful city and I visited it before just on travels, but I thought, no, this could be home. And, and it really became home very quickly. And, and while I was here, um, so I came here to study initially to get another degree because <laughs> that's sort of my thing. I love to learn. Um, and while I was getting my MBA, I started looking around, you know, thinking about well, what, what's next, you know, in my career mm -hmm. professionally, could I go down the consulting route, which is a very sort of logical place to go after being an analyst or should maybe become a you know banker, which is another sort of typical career path for MBAs. But I knew I wanted to be my own boss and I knew I didn't want to operate in a large hierarch hierarchical organization again, or at least for the time being. And so again, testing myself and then, <laughs> and pushing the envelope a bit, I, I did a lot of what I call sort of mini experiments with different industries, different sectors, different types of roles in much more early stage, more startup style businesses. And I thought I could do this, you know, I, mm -hmm. I don't know what or when or how, but I could do this. And, and that's what I did. So while I was getting my degree, I, started a real estate investment and development company, which I'm still the CEO of. Uh, and we do, you know, large construction, smaller projects, as well as just your sort of normal vanilla rental uh, stuff. And again, after building that and growing that and uh, starting to slowly take myself out of the day-to-day -day operations, I started finding myself getting much more satisfaction from or a, di a different type of satisfaction from some of the informal uh, mentoring I was doing and coaching mm -hmm. because all along that business uh, growth journey where I was figuring it out for myself and learning new things and meeting new people I found myself being approached for advice or guidance and um, mm -hmm. tips and, and insights and I thought I really want to help these people you know there were often other other founders, but a lot of the times they were, you know, executives of, of larger companies who just needed a sounding board. And one of the things that I really, really developed uh, a knack for while at the CIA was being able to cut to the core of an issue, to, mm. to, you know, find the signal from the noise as it were, and really get down to what are the fundamental key things that are at work here that need addressing or adapting or shifting or changing, and then helping the people who were in charge make that shift or that change or, or adaptation. And so that's that's basically what I do now is much more um, to leadership coaching and working with businesses on strategy and growth and transition. And then um, on a much on a sort of slightly uh, bigger scale, uh, doing public speaking events and, and workshops for you know sort of hundreds and thousands. And then my book, which you alluded to. So there, there's a whistle stop tour of, uh, of of my career. I think I think it's fascinating. It's it's it's, it's interesting the parallels between what you've done in your career and what I've done. You know, maybe my difference is I stopped in 22 years of corporate life as well. So, but the military corporate life, then I went the entrepreneur journey. But then now I find myself again wanting to coach and teach and train and, and speak. And that seems yeah. to be more of what I'm doing these days. And I, and I enjoy it. It's, it's kind of yeah. almost like a natural progression, if you will. Yeah. So a similar yeah. similar path as well. Um, one of the things I, was, I want to ask you is, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, you were, you were as, as a CIA officer, you were operating in war zones. I mean, you were operating in very, like you said, difficult uh, environments, difficult, difficult climates, difficult. I mean, you, you, you weren't getting creature comforts in a lot of places that you were at. So what, what kind of leadership lessons did you learn through those type of experiences that were, you were, you know, p potentially in an uncomfortable situation, in a dangerous situation, what, what were some of the things that you learned through that process and how, do, and how does that help you as a CEO of a company? I think the biggest one is one of the words that you just used, which is comfort. And for me, it was getting comfortable with discomfort. <laughs> so finding a way, whatever whatever way that you know I could do so, is to just really get used to the discomfort, the change, both the physical discomforts and and but also you know not being in an environment that was predictable, not being in an environment where you knew what was necessarily going to happen, where you couldn't control pretty much anything, and and really just 
accepting that and not trying to constantly fight against it. And I think, you know, in a war zone, it's a totally different uh, type of mentality, but that similar idea of getting comfortable with discomfort is something that CEOs of all stripes and leaders of all stripes really need to find a way to make peace with because mm -hmm. it's not ever gonna be comfortable. I mean, it'll be easier, but there will always be unexpected challenges, um, unpleasant surprises, things outside of our control, things that we can't manage or can't foresee or can't um, create contingencies for. And being able to just accept that that is part of the process is something that has been so hugely valuable to me because when I do get thrown a curveball or, you know, again, in the work I do with others, it's, it's, it's just accepting that it's not personal. It's not a yep. indication of your failure as a leader or a personal, you know, um, uh, personal, um, uh, what do you call it? A lack of, you know, some sort of a personal ability. That is just reality. And the sooner you can make your peace with that, the easier time, it, being a leader is never easy, but if you can get comfortable being uncomfortable, it will, it will be a little bit smoother. Yeah, absolutely. Especially as an entrepreneur in a startup situation, you're going to have a lot of, it, it's difficult and, it, and the yeah. path is long. And if you haven't, um, if, if you don't have, if you haven't, you know, gone through and, and developed perseverance, you're, you'll struggle because it, it is, you know, a lot of times it's, you know, you, you see the future where you think you want to be, but then the reality is where you yes. are today. Like, like, <laughs> I know where we're going to be, but I got to make payroll today. And how, how am yeah. I going to do that? So it's, it's, um, yeah. it's definitely a struggle. And I, I think those, those experiences of being uncomfortable and, and, and persevering make you a better, I think, better entrepreneur, a better CEO, because you have that level of perseverance and others may not have. So definitely. Yeah, that's and also, I think it's, you know, it's one of those things that it gets, easier with practice instead of running away from it instead of running away from every um you know potential challenge and trying to create these massive sort of safety nets it's again accepting that it's just part of the process and recognizing that you know i firmly believe that things like perseverance and resilience are like muscles right they need to be stressed and they need to be tested in order for them to get stronger and it's not like you're given a set amount of resilience or perseverance you know at birth and then you sort of run out of your allocation it's Every time you overcome a challenge, every time you see yourself through a problem, every time you aren't beaten back by whatever sort of life throws your way, it builds your resilience and your perseverance for the next time and the next time and the next time. So it is, again, instead of trying to run away from it and shield ourselves and our businesses from it, it's something to, in however way we can, lean into and own and acknowledge that it is going to make ourselves, our businesses, our, our you know, our um, ourselves as leaders that much stronger for the next time around, because there will be a next time. Oh yeah, for sure, hundred <laughs> percent. So yeah. tell us, tell us about the book. I love it. I love the title from C CIA to CEO. Why did you feel compelled to write this book, and who is it for? What what, what kind of people are going to really uh, learn a lot from this? So it's fundamentally for, I would say, growth-oriented people. So people writ large, but maybe specifically leaders, um, whether corporate leaders or, or, or startup leaders, who are willing to do the work to really analyze themselves and their situations and sort of their approach to living and leading in a totally new way. So this isn't for someone who's sort of, you know, complacent and, and you know, has a very fixed mindset about stuff. It's for people, at, like I said, leaders who want to, who want to be better, think bigger, lead better and be bolder. And the reason I wrote the book is because in so much of the one-on-one -on -one or the one to small group work that I was doing, a lot of these same themes kept coming up around resilience, around challenges, around you know, overcoming obstacles, around the inner work that a lot of leaders don't think they need to do and that are, is often dismissed as quote unquote soft skills, you know, mm -hmm. things around values and how you show up and how you, um, how you deal with you know, different uh, personality types in, 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 a, in a corporate environment or how you deal with your own personality type and, tr and without trying to conform to a stereotype of what you think a leader should look like or what mm -hmm. the industry should bring out in you. And so it's really, I, the way I like to think about it is to help people sort of shake things up a little bit, shake up business as usual, shake up leadership as usual and create new paths to success for themselves. That's really cool. And, you know, and it's interesting, too, because I think you're taking these really unique 
experiences from a very unique job, if you will, as a, a loosely, <laughs> I'll call it a job, but as a, in the CIA and bringing this, these lessons into, into leadership, into, into business. And one of the ones I want to talk to you about was, you know, I mean, obviously, um, uh, you know, you know, in the CIA, you're talking about things like profiling and situational awareness and how, how can leaders use uh, you know, some of those tools from the CIA to help them, you know, basically uncover and amplify individual strengths of either people that work for, for you or maybe potentially customers or partners. How, how does that help and how can, how can leaders use some of those tools? How do you talk about it in the book? Yeah, so those are some really powerful self-awareness tools because I think the best leaders know themselves and again, don't try to conform or, or be other than who they are, but know how to activate or mute different aspects of their personality based on what the situation demands. So things like profiling, again, in a CIA context, it's, you know, when you profile a target, you learn the ins and outs, you do psycho mm -hmm. psychological profiles, you learn, understand their behaviors, what makes them tick, their, their network, their connections, all of that big and small stuff, uh, big and small things that go into making up what, how you understand that target. And I think by turning instead of looking outwards and turning inwards and targeting ourselves effectively and profiling ourselves, it helps us understand and bring to the light a lot of the things that we just take for granted. And it makes very concrete for us things that we might have just assumed to be true for everybody or um, mm -hmm. assumed to have been a fixed part of who we are, whether it's by you know genetics or, or temperament or whatever. And again, it's to shake that up and start asking those questions. Well, it's like, you know, this is what I thought my profile was based on how I've you know, behaved or how I've um, executed my career to date. But for example, by taking a few profiling tests, you know, and, and a lot, I mean, everybody, most companies use them, things like the Myers-Briggs or StrengthsFinder or Wealth Dynamics. And, and you know, they're all, they're not totally comprehensive. No one profile is going to be able to describe the entire complexity of an individual human being. But taken together, I think a lot of these different, you know, publicly available profiling systems can help really build a, a very informative picture of who you are and what are the persistent themes and patterns throughout your life and that run throughout the various, you know, sort of res responses you get from these profiling systems. And then the trick is, again, not to, to make excuses for ourselves or to be like, oh, well, that's just because I'm an introvert or that's just because I'm, you know, an ISTJ or, you know, whatever right, it is based right. on your profile, but to then leverage that knowledge, that self-awareness and adapt it and shift it in a way that's going to be useful and powerful in a business context. So I'll give you a very simple um, and a slightly unusual example. One of the profiling systems that I love is, um, is the five love languages. Now, there's a great book written by, I think he's a minister or a marriage counselor um, called The Love Languages. And effectively, he talks about these five languages where that's how you express love and that's how you also receive love from others. And the five uh, languages are words of affirmation, physical touch, quality time, uh, gifts, and, uh, oh gosh, there's another one. I can't remember. There's a fifth one. <laughs> and when I took that test for myself and figured out what my profile would be, one of my strongest love languages was quality time. Now, yes, of course, in a, in a relationship interpersonal context, I'll, you know, I'll use that to inform how I, you know, protect my time for loved ones and others. But in a business context, I had to think, okay, well, I am the same person. So if this is a fundamental sort of part of my, my personality, my profile, how might this show up in a business context? And so I thought, well, my quality time with my work is really important to me. Having that focused time to create, you know, whether it's workshops or events or just, you know, do writing, whatever it is, that quality time is really, really valuable. And I know that's one of my love languages. So how can I protect that time in a business context? And one of the simplest things I did in order to do that was to turn off my voicemail on my cell phone so people can't interrupt me and leave me voicemails and I'm not constantly checking messages and to also get a call answering service for my business um, yeah. for my business phone number. <laughs> so again, you know, it's a small thing and it, and it is, it's, it's slightly unusual, right? You're like, well, why am I talking about love languages in a, in a business podcast? But again, the profiles follow us everywhere we go, right? It's not like, okay, well, I only care about quality time in one context and I don't ca care about it in another. It's just the form it takes will be different. So by using these various profiling systems to inform all aspects of our lives, 
it can just be a really powerful way of taking out the little frictions, the micro frustrations that can follow us throughout the course of our days. And all of these, you know, making things a little bit smoother, getting that a little bit 1% better, you know, all of those great metaphors makes a huge difference over time. To, it makes it just that much easier to lead. I love that. I love the idea of, of, of self-awareness and using these tools to become better aware, even of how you how you operate, how you lead. I, I, that, that is really powerful. I mean, I love the idea of, of having, you know, for you it was quality times. It was turning off your your notifications. I know for me, I never have my ringer on. So my <laughs> wife, it drives everybody crazy because I, because I, I focus, I like focus work yeah. as well. So, and I'll figure yeah. I'll call you back whenever, but, exactly. but the other thing like for me is least I was most creative in the morning. So I do creative yes. work yeah. in the morning, whereas yeah. afternoon I do grunt work, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, yep. there's always grunt work to be done. Yep. And so I always like save that for the afternoon where I just turn my brain off. Maybe I put some music on and I just do all the grunt work I got to do, you know, I've got to do for the business, but that's all yeah. about self-awareness and knowing yeah. what works for you and what works exactly. for you. And, and I think you can use the same tools with others, learning what makes sure. other people tick. How yeah. are people motivated? I have one employee that's not a morning person, but every morning I say, good morning, how are you? And he's like, oh, he, he grunts and crumbles. <laughs> but, but I don't get upset because that's just him every morning. So yes. I know I know yes. my employees and it's the same exactly. thing. You know yourself, know your employees. I love that. Uh, yeah. That's interesting. I never even thought about those being like CIA kind of tools that really work really well uh, for yourself and, 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 and in leadership. That's fantastic. One thing you said too, uh, you've got in the book is, this personal energy map. And yes. maybe you could explain to us a little bit, what is that and how can we use that to kind of create a leadership style that is more authentic, honest, and sustainable? So tell us a little bit about that. Cause that was pretty exciting when I read about that. Yeah. So it's, um, it's similar to actually something that you just raised right now, where, you know, you said your, your, your employee's not a morning person, right. all of us, yeah, yes, we might know generally if we're morning people or, or night owls, et cetera, because that's something that comes up a lot. But right. all of us have, what again, what I've called personal energy maps, which is, you know, these natural ebbs and flows in our energy for things like creative work or things like grunt work or, you know, more strategic big picture things or, you know, more detailed things or being sociable and meeting with clients or negotiating or whatever it is. But we're so often forced into a totally artificially constructed nine to five, eight to six, whatever sort of environment that we never really give much thought to. Well, mm -hmm. is this coming up against the way I naturally operate? Yes. Because we've never yes. been given the luxury to ask that question. But of course, not everybody in the universe is going to be able to operate optimally between nine and five or eight to six, whatever it is. And so tuning into your personal energy map is all about you know, again, reflecting inwards, analyzing yourself and your natural patterns and rhythms. And it's not just over the course of a day, it could be over the course of a week, over the course of a season or a year. Yeah. And so, for example, I know, like you, I am at my most creative between the hours. Well, I don't know if these are your hours, but for me, it's between the hours of 4 a.m. and 8 a.m. So <laughs> if I'm up during those hours, which I'm not always because I have two small children, but if I am, that is what I do. I work on the creative work and nothing else. I don't check email. I don't do invoices. I don't do any of that admin. I focus on the creative work to maximize where my natural alignment is at that time of day. Then, yes, between sort of the hours of 11 and 1, where I'm on a slightly energetic slump, just before lunch, I'll do some of the grunt work, some of the tedious admin that doesn't require a lot of the, you know, the high firing um, cylinders in my brain. But similarly, over the course of a year, you know, I am solar powered. So, and I'm a bit of a, <laughs> of a nerd. So, you know, sort of the spring months and then September are where I really come alive. And I, you know, that's where I try to focus most of my outward activities, my speaking engagements, my workshops, my being in front of, you know, audiences work, because that's when I can leverage what's already happening internally, and then make it that much more powerful when I'm delivering it externally. But, you know, in the dead of sort of November, December, January, I'm trying as little, I'm trying to do as little of that stuff as possible because I hibernate, you know, my body starts to wind down, slow down mentally, you know, I, everything is just starting to come to a bit of a lull. And so, yes, I can force myself out of it and, and power through if I need to, 
but being aware of my personal energy map allows me to operate in alignment with it whenever I can, and then to make deviations consciously when I can't. So again, it's not about being all or nothing. And yes, we can't recreate our entire lives and our worlds and our you know, work environments to conform to our personal energy maps. But once we start uncovering it, we can start to make tweaks and ask yeah. our boss, for example, hey, look, you know, I'm just brain dead from the hours of three to five. If I need to be on and do a presentation, can we try to organize it for between 10 and 11? So that way, you know, I'm just doing it that much more effectively or whatever it is. But it's again, it's about being thoughtful and being aware of these rhythms and patterns so that we can leverage them whenever possible. I love that. That's so cool. I, I, you know, you got me thinking about too, in my industry, like we have trade show season, it's usually in the spring. So like we get out of winter and then we start having all these trade shows around the country. And it is almost like, it feels good. Like it feels like, okay, the warm weather's coming. We're getting outside again. We're hitting the road. And it sort of, it kind of matches a natural rhythm for, for me, at least the same thing. You come out of the winter and you're like, okay, I want to go see people again. I want to go you know, go to these big events. And that that's interesting. I never really thought about it from a year cycle, but yeah, we have those cycles as well too. So it's not For just, sure. it's not just the day or the week, but it's also the year as well. Definitely. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. So tell, tell me what this is. Cause I, I didn't understand this. And so I hope, hopefully you can, you can explain it. Yeah. Tactical ignorance. And yeah. uh, what is that? And why is it so valuable for leaders and entrepreneurs? So uh, people often look at the word ignorance and like, oh, that's a that's a very heavy right. word, and it's very charged. So, it's in this context, it is tempered by the word tactical. So, okay. when I refer to tactical ignorance, I'm talking about being very strategic and very deliberate about the things that we are consciously ignoring and the things that we let our, let that we bring into our minds. So for example, as leaders, as CEOs, as entrepreneurs, there is so much noise, so much input, so much potential data vying for our attention. Yeah. And it is our jobs as leaders to be able to be tactically ignorant about the stuff that is just noise right. and curate our environment so that we are only receiving the signal. So it can be in a very specific data sense where it's, you know, knowing your source and making sure that you're only taking in the inputs from reliable sources, qualified sources, experienced sources, et cetera, or it can be a more uh, intangible. So for example, when I was in a war zone, one of my jobs was to brief the commanding general of US and international forces. I'm a 20 something <laughs> civilian female going in to brief this four star general. And I, you know, I had the thankless job of sometimes having to disagree with him or disagree with what his intelligence uh, sort of community was telling him and, and his, his guys on the ground, which is always going to be a thankless job. But I went into it using what I sort of developed, which is this tactical ignorance, which is ignoring all of the noise around his rank, his superiority, the, the, you know, the mismatch between, you know, who he is and how important he is and how unimportant I am and all of that stuff that is masked as data and potentially useful and just focus on the signal, which was, what is my job here? My job is to go in and brief him on the latest intelligence, have information and facts to back it up and to respectfully disagree when there was disagreement, not taking into account all of that other stuff about who's sitting where and how many stars are in the room and how much more experience they've had here because that's just noise. So being tactically ignorant about that stuff, all the atmospherics and focusing just on what I needed to focus on makes it that much easier to deliver what I was supposed to deliver, which was mm. the intelligence that he needed to hear. So it can be in any context. Sometimes it's mental, uh, you're being tactically ignorant mentally and in how you prepare for something, whether it's a presentation or a pitch or whatever, a meeting with the board. And sometimes it's actually being ignorant about the data and the information, but tactically, very carefully choosing it as opposed to just burying our heads in the sand. I really like that. I never really thought about it, but, but you're right. I see too many people I see get overwhelmed in situations where you know, they've got to present to upper management, right? You know, and it's the first time they've ever done it. And they've got a great message. You want that message delivered, but they're just, the whole environment is just, ah, you know, and they're nervous. And, 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 and I like the idea of just tactically making decisions about what you're going to ignore so you can focus on the task at hand. Very exactly. interesting. 
Very interesting. Exactly. I love that. So w- would you say that you're today, you're a better leader today because of your time you served in the CIA? Would, or or what, do, would you say, what are some unique things that make you a better leader today because you went through that experience? I think one of the things that I took away from our time at the CIA, my time at the CIA was just an, an appreciation for knowing that I don't know everything. Mm. So for example, you know, there were, and this happened a lot at the agency because obviously everything we do is classified, right? So we'd get pilloried and slammed in the press and people would say, oh, you've screwed this up and oh, you've done that. And oh, and we could never defend ourselves. We could never be like, hey, but here's all the evidence to prove to the otherwise because all of the evidence was confidential, right? So it's that appreciation that We never have the whole picture. And in that situation, internally, we had the whole picture and we could celebrate in the shadows and say, hey, hey, you know, don't listen to what the New York Times or the Washington Post said because we know the reality. But to the outside world, it was a totally different picture. And so that humility of knowing that as smart as we are, as much of the facts as we think we have, as good as the journalists might have been or whatever the case may be, there's almost always something you don't know. And knowing that is is really important because it keeps you humble in the most important sense of never thinking you're the expert or you know everything. And it opens up the possibility for other people to either challenge your ideas or refine your ideas or to have good ideas that you consider. Because too often I think leadership is sold as this thing where you're the decider and what you say goes and it's my way or the highway and you know you have to be right all the time. But I fundamentally believe that sort of a, a, a learning leader is a much more powerful leader. Mm-hmm. And the only way you become a learning leader is if you are open to the possibility that you don't know everything. Mm-hmm. I love that. And, and that's just, I'm writing it down because I like, it's a great quote. A learning leader is a powerful leader. And uh, absolutely. And, you know, I'm, I'm in the game a long time, over 30 years yeah. leading people and I'm learning something new every day. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, if you're not, if you're not taking that approach to leadership, you're missing out on a big, on, on one of the most important parts of leaders, leadership is learning every day, especially from the people yeah. around you, you know, exactly. the, the insights you can get from employees sometimes can change change an industry it can change exactly. you can change trajectory if you're willing to, to be humble and listen to other ideas other than what's in your own brain and and exactly. uh, and what you know so that's that's really powerful this has been uh really really good stuff so how can people find out more about you and this new book uh so it's very easy they can just go to my website which is rupalypatel.com don't be fooled. I am not the Indian actress who's been in lots of sitcoms in <laughs> India. Uh, there is a there is another Rupal Patel who is an Indian actress, but I'm just RupalYPatel.com, and you can find out everything you need to know about me, working together, the book, everything is there. Fantastic. We'll put a link in the show notes for that. Thank you. Rupal, thank you for coming on the show and sharing all of this. This is really exciting. And I think the book is, uh, we, we, we just scratched the surface, but there's so much in the book and I encourage people to go out, check it out. It's called From CIA to CEO. Go find it, go to the website. And this is an exciting new book. So thank you for coming on the show and sharing all this information. It's been my pleasure, John. Thank you for having um, some really great questions and being such a great conversationalist. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.